Today's guest is a climate feminist hero of mine and a fierce advocate for a healthy planet. Um, I became familiar with Heather McTeer Tony's work when I read her wonderful essay, Collards Are Just As Good As Kale, in um, the All We Can Save anthology. Um, I was drawn in by the warmth of her words, the way she described her deep, rich, ancestral connection to the land, and her undeterred passion in fighting for climate justice. Um, I'm just really so honored and humbled and excited to be hosting her today in the garden. Um, a brief introduction, uh, Heather is a prominent national figure in the area of environmental policy, public service and community engagement in the United States. She's a self-proclaimed recovering politician and served as regional administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency's Southeast region under President Barack Obama and was also two-term mayor of Greenville, Mississippi. She currently serves as the climate justice liaison for the Environmental Defense Fund and senior advisory to Moms Clean Air Force, an organization combating air pollution. She is an expert on environmental and climate justice with SheSource, a publication of the Women's Media Center, and she's worked all around the world. She's known for advocating and training diverse officials on leadership and climate in over 15 countries, including Kenya, France, Portugal, Nigeria, and Senegal. She has appeared on news outlets such as CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and Democracy Now! Heather, welcome. I am so thrilled that you're joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me in the garden. And can I say that you have some of the most beautiful artistry oh. at work. I have been so just enthralled with all of the, the lovely images. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. Oh, thank you. Um, so I um, all the love back because I loved your essay so much. I reread it many, many times. Um, and one thing I really loved about your writing is that that you really weave a deeply personal narrative into your advocacy work. And the words that come to my mind are rooted and grounded. And I think I want to start the conversation there um, to hear about your childhood, what you were like as a young girl, and also um, as you do so beautifully in your essay, how do those these, do these early memories, um, how do they shape your path towards environmental justice? Yeah. So that is, um, I guess, a, a rooted and grounded is a beautiful way of also saying I am a Mississippi Delta native. Uh, and some of the just the, the words that I think of when I think of how I grew up and where I grew up and um, the privilege I had of growing up in a space that was surrounded by community and love and family in a way that most of the country describes in a different fashion, um, really colored how I saw myself, how I saw climate action and how I really didn't even connect the two until much later in my life. Um, I'm the daughter of a retired civil rights uh, attorney and a retired school teacher who both they traveled um, to Mississippi from Baltimore, Maryland as part of the voters rights um, movement. They're supposed to stay in Mississippi for two years and here, you know, 40 plus odd years later, <laughs> they still have roots in Mississippi and both my brother and I were born in, uh, in the Mississippi Delta in Greenville. I like to characterize my kid myself as like that kid that was running around all of the political meetings or the, the meetings to put together a protest or something. I was the kid in the back of the room that was messing up all the papers. Like I was the one who, when it was time to go out and maybe campaign for somebody who was stapling the stuff wrong, who was playing and coloring on stuff, a, a, a perfect description of my children right now. <laughs> but more, more importantly, I was in the room. Uh, as were a lot of people, a lot of kids, because, you know, childcare, um, if you were going to be an activist and you were going to be a part of these things, there were children there. And, and I was one of those kids. And even coming up, um, I recognized the importance of taking care of community and how community was raising a generation to, in some way, make sure that we were continuing the traditions of our community while uh, moving us all forward. And then that's why I came back home and ran for mayor. 
What I didn't realize though, was all of the connections that were natural to me um, and that were natural to the space were environmental and climate concerns that I just oversaw. And I didn't really make those connections until um, it was uh, then administrator Lisa Jackson who was coming to my community to do uh, a tour of small communities dealing with uh, water issues at the time, because that's what I was working on. And she uh, pulled me to the side and said, you know, this is environmental justice work, right? And I was like, no, it's, it's really not. She's like, no, really it is. <laughs> and that in and of itself just sort of opened up my eyes in a way that I had not recognized. I grew up in an agrarian place where every single thing was in some way associated to space, land, nature, environment, and through a lens of, of, of equity and justice. So the Mississippi River was literally less than a half of a mile away from my house um, on Lake Ferguson. I, I knew when the uh, river would ebb and flow, when it would rise and fall, um, based upon like if the casinos, you could see them from the top of the levee and know what the levee was, <laughs> because that meant there was a high water versus low water. And when that happened, um, I always associated fall and harvest with football season. Uh, I could tell you when the spring was coming by when the crop dusters were flying over, but also, you know, connected to the, the trauma and pain of that because those same crop dusters that would identify when this, you know, spring planting and, and weeding was taking place. Uh, there were black men who stood in the fields as flag men. And if you don't know what a flag man is, it's someone who's standing so that when the, the crop dusters fly over, they know what role they're on. So you can just imagine being literally sprayed with pesticides in a yellow slicker uh, as part of the experience of coming up and seeing this on a regular basis. So I began to connect those dots and recognize, oh my God, every single thing that I grew up around was in some way connected in imagery to the environment, either my connection to it or its impression upon me. I mean, this even went into when I went to college. I was a um, legislative aide for Senator Donzella James when, at the Georgia State Legislature when I was in college. And not even recognizing it in that space, a lot of the constituency meetings that I would go to were environmental. People who were concerned about a landfill in their community or some odd smell and she was responding. So repeatedly I saw there must be a missing link if every single thing that I can physically or in some way identify with is connected to climate and environment, why don't I see myself in this space? What has happened such that I cannot find an image of me as an environmentalist, uh, a black woman from the South, when my entire life has been in some way impacted by the environment. And that's really how I, I capture and, and feel myself in this space. I can't disconnect who I am from the environment because it's so interwoven. Yeah. That's, that's such a powerful answer. I'm, I'm loving this conversation. I'm actually also um, similar to you, came really late to realizing that I was an environmentalist. I, before I became an artist, I worked in policy for a long time, 10 years actually. And um, I was always on the social justice side of things. And you know, I was even working, I, there was one summer I spent in Coachella working with farm workers and mm. you know, dealing with um, you know, their, their water being undrinkable and them getting sick from the pesticides, but still not making the link because honestly, when I would go to DC and do, you know, when I was in um, graduate school and do these uh, internships and stuff, I saw this really like clear division between the social justice people and the environmentalists. And I didn't right. feel part of the environmentalist group because I don't know, I just, it, it, they, they weren't my tribe, it didn't feel like. And, um, mm -hmm. and, it, and I, I, that's why I loved the All We Can Save anthology and just what, you know, what we're calling this, um, the climate feminist renaissance is because suddenly there's space mm. for, cli for, for climate justice um, and for, for, for someone, you know, like you and someone like me to, to be invited into the space. So I totally, your words really resonate with me. Um, mm. And this ties in nicely to the next question. Um, so I really appreciate when you're speaking that you have this embodied no knowledge of 
the problem. And I think that because you are close to the problem, you are also close to the solutions. I think that's actually a line even from, from the book. Um, could you talk more about this? How have your lived experiences informed your work and your understanding of the problem and also your envisioning of its solutions? You know, it's a it's a great way building on what you know you said before, sort of the, the vision between climate and social justice. We've always envisioned climate change, environmental actions, climate justice as one of the many boxes of issues that we have to deal with. You got housing discrimination, racial inequity, economic disparities, health issues, and then you got this thing over here called climate change. In fact, when we, when we poll about it leave it as a separate issue. And what I came to realize and embody is that it's not one of the separate boxes. It's actually the table that the box sits on. It is what is underlying all of these issues, underlying every single challenge, and at the same time, providing us an opportunity to build solutions that can address both the climate and in, uh, inequities, um, as well as some of the social disparities. So when I think of something like, um, let's, let's take, we, our country is reeling right now after the verdict from the George Floyd murder. Uh, it came out last night. I was actually teaching a class, a seminar uh, for the University of Chicago at the moment that it was happening, right? So we were living this very, very real, very full moment. At the same time that we were learning about how um, extreme weather and, and data shows us that extreme weather increases um, shootings in the United States. There's a great New York Times article that actually shows and lays out the data that the warmer it gets, if we want to, the name of the, the piece is if you want to talk about murder, let's talk about weather. And so what a time to have this, kind of, this particular conversation. But what it was really stressing was that we cannot separate these things. If we want to deal with and address justice when it comes to violence, whether it is police violence, domestic violence, child abuse, we have to acknowledge that there are connections between the warming climate and how people respond, their behavior, their angst to get angry. And this is not just something that we feel. It is actual um, sub, there's subjective and objective information that leads, leads us to that. Culturally, I'm like, we've been knowing this for years. How many times did, you know, um, in the Black community in Greenville, did folks say, oh, it's about to get hot outside, people act foolish? It's not new. You know, our, our, our lived experiences have told us this is what happens as it gets warm. And so if we know this, be, this information from both lived experience and layering on top of that scientific data and then adding into that, the fact that we live and have a global climate crisis, we are getting warmer and there are wonderful maps that are out there that show us where we're going to be in the next you know, 50 years, then it gives us the perfect platform to say, well, here's how we address the problem. Here's how we can be proactive if these are the factors that we know. We can reduce heat islands in urban communities where there is an increase of this activity. We can get people out of what we called concrete jungles and projects, which came apart uh, as uh, of racist housing policies in the 50s and 60s, and deconstruct some of the practices that have led us here while at the same time providing jobs, innovation, opportunity to really take part in a green revolution and just change the dynamic around wealth in um, marginalized communities. So I see these two always connected together. You can't talk about the problem without talking about the solution. A, culturally, this is not what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and, and then B, there's such a huge, um, huge win here for us. Uh, I, I tell my kids, I have a four-year-old and a 15-year-old. I'm like, I'm not working forever. Mommy's going to retire and I'm going to retire in a happy place. And I need you <laughs> to make sure that, you know, you're thinking about jobs and careers that can take you wherever you want to go. And examining that through the lens of climate and environmental innovation um, helps us to get there 
as opposed to saying, oh, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. Oh, yes. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> touched on, you touched on two such wonderful points and things that get me really excited. One is the sort of the, the, the idea or just the truth that climate is a symptom and not the problem. And, and that is, you know, and I think that the thinking of the environmentalist movement before was so siloed, you know, you're talking about putting things into little neat boxes. I mean, they really did. It was like, this is the environment. All the other issues are over there. We'll get to them later. Right. Oh, they're, they're, as you said, it's the table that it's upon it. You have to address that first injustice, that first, um, you know, dis- disalignment. Um, mm-hmm. And then the second thing that you, you said that also just made my heart sing was, you know, the solutions, like staying in the yes. And I get really excited about that. I mean, I walk around the city and I imagine like, what's gonna, what's it gonna be like when there's no, you know, combustion engines? What's the air going <laughs> like? You know, I just, sometimes I get impatient. I'm like, oh, I wanna be in that world already. You know, it's gonna be better. So I love that, the power of the yes. Um, so this, the next question I have for you, I've been so excited to ask you. So as I mentioned, I, I worked in policy for, for a long time. And as you see, I'm an artist, like I've got a policy <laughs> mom, So that I felt <laughs> that I didn't, didn't work out in the, in the long run. But, um, so I, but I really felt hemmed in by the expectation to sort of um, separate my mind and my heart and to come in neutral. Like I, I really felt like I kind of had to put on a suit and leave, you know, my weirdo artist self and my feeling heart and a lot of things at the door before I went into the room as a policy mm-hmm. anal- analyst. And, um, and you, you seem to bring your full self to your work. Um, and although we've never met in person, I can just feel the love that you have for your family, your community, humanity, the planet. It really just emanates from you and, um, and it seems to shape and guide everything you do and it feels so authentic. And, mm-hmm. um, and I really admire it. And, and I was wondering if you could tell me how, <laughs> how and why, and how, how do you do that? How, how, how um, do you bring your full self to your work? It's so admirable. Oh, I, cause I did it the wrong way for so long. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I tried to fit myself into what I thought society thought I should be and look like. Um, I was a very young mayor. I I was elected when I was 27 and charged with running a city where there had never been an African-American, there had never been a female, and Lord knows there had never been somebody under 30. So I, you know, spent a lot of time and stress trying to conform to something that I had no way of identifying with other than television. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, through figuring out how do I make myself fit in this space. The people in my community did not raise in me a white man to lead them, yet that's all that had been there. So I, you know, we were in this weird place of trying to figure out, okay, how does this work? Who am I? Can I bring my whole spell? And and, and I suppressed it for so long. It made me sick. And, and I found myself having to make a decision. You know, people will kill you. So either I can be who I am. And I found that the more I was just who I was all the time, uh, I was happier, but I was also more successful. Uh, and then being authentic and not hiding that, people you know, seem to understand and be more willing to collaborate. And I come from just this really unique space. So I, I, you know, I say all that to say, I sort of learned it the hard way. Now, I also had great mentors. And I I always say, surround yourself with people who um, can teach you something. My mom would tell me, make sure you have friends that are older than you and younger than you. Um, So you're constantly in this place of of learning, both from experience as well as from innovation. And I have found that to be so important, but it also gives space to to sort of share what you're doing, what you're going through and to be real about it. We see that more today than we did, you know, 15 years ago when I was in office. No women would, you know, would talk about 
how they weren't perfect. People expected women, and they still do to some extent, but we're calming down off of that. Um, people expected women in, in government to be perfect, it, to, to be able to manage your household, you know, your husband, your kids, your job, flawless hair, you know, no runs in your stockings. If you're going to do this, then you must be a superwoman in order to pull this off. And it was just not real. So I started being real. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> my marriage didn't work out, got divorced. This real is what happens. Um, you know, don't have any money in my bank account. That's real is what happens. Um, my kid made a bad grade or, um, you know, just these different experiences that I had been very, um, very reserved about, I, I discovered were actually a testimony to other people and other women who needed to hear those stories to understand that A, it's okay, B, you will survive, and three, there is greater on the other side. So it, it's a constant process for me. It is a constant awareness of making sure that you, what you see is what you're going to get. And that is all of the love, all of the feelings, um, the emotions that come along with it. But it's also what leaders do because you cannot run from a moment when people are expecting you to leave. You can't melt into the floor. You cannot you know, say, I give up, I'm not doing this. You have to be who you are because that's who people are relying on and depending on. Um, you know, again, going back to the session last night, um, I, someone I remember asking, you know, do you really want to have the session we can put this off? I was like, no, 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 we're going to sit in this moment, right? This is, this is real. Um, this is not pretend and we're not going to turn away. We're not going to look away. Far too often, uh, I think people in our society have this, this privilege of looking away and not really and altruistically embracing what your fellow man is going through and embracing how it looks and how they're, they're walking in it. We have to do more of that. I am a woman of faith. I was raised in a non-denominational and a Baptist and a Pentecostal church. Like I... When did, I could tell you the church schedule from Monday to Sunday um, and just about every <laughs> every stereotypical story that you can think of from, you know, going to the corner store between Sunday school and church service to having to be there on Wednesday night Bible study to being, you know, sleep on the chairs on Friday, um, all of it. But all of it is a part of me. I, that's my belief. I can't tell you how many people I have run into who have said, I don't understand how can you believe in God and climate at the same time? It was like, well, it's pretty easy to me. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not challenging. It's not difficult. It can be done. <laughs> Living right. I mean, there's, there's imagery of nature and environment throughout scripture. I think God has a pretty good idea of what's happening and going on. Um, but Claire, you don't know how many emails I've gotten from people who've just said, thank you for sharing your faith because I'm a Christian and I don't feel comfortable. I'm like, well, come on. You know, that's part of why it's important to be authentic um, and to find places of collaboration. Yeah, I love, I love this, um, everything you're saying. It, it's, it's so, um, yeah, you're just, you're touching on so many points that resonate, I'm sure, with, with all of us. Um, yeah, the, the idea that in order, I mean, I think it's so funny, right? They want you to be a superwoman, right? To sort of be perfect. But in order to do that, you have to leave all your superpowers the right. things that make you, Heather McTeer Tony, such an amazing climate active, uh, advocate, to leave all of that stuff at the door. Like, why, right? I mean, that's, those are truly the things that make you such an incredible voice and, and, and force for change. Um, it's, it also reminds me of this, uh, we had a really nice conversation um, in the garden last week with a, um, it's actually a, a psychologist and she, she works with grief, with grief and trauma and climate. And we were talking about um, 
sort of this turning away from grief and how that actually, and, and being like quote unquote happy or nice ends up just flattening the human experience. And also mm -hmm. how we show up for one another and the gifts that we're able to exchange to one another. So yes. um, yeah, I loved hearing that, that journey. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. It, it, is, it is so powerful. I can remember when I met my husband now, I'm, I'm divorced, but remarried. Um, when we first met, he asked me, um, so what do you do? And I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm the mayor of the city. And he's like, no, 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 no. But what do you do? Like, what do you do? <laughs> and it totally caught me off guard because I was like, I don't know what I do. I don't know. You know he was asking me, who are you in essence? And I'm sure he thought, okay, this woman is really weird because she can only identify with this you know, position. But it was um, uh, it, the start of what is still in our, our wonderful um, and hilarious relationship of making sure that I'm always true to myself, right? No matter what else is going on, I'm, I'm Heather and then I'm always going to be and bring Heather and I'm going to look for the authenticity and other people. And sometimes that's funny. Sometimes it's in a moment, very real. Sometimes it's tears, um, but connecting to climate and environment and our own humanity through our five physical senses leads us into this place where we can talk, I think, on a deeper level about how do we get to real equitable solutions? Like, what do we need to do? And when I understand that space for you and you understand that space for me, we can tend to find what is the middle ground. Like, if I'm upfront and honest and say, okay, these are the things that sort of really concern me. Yeah. You don't have to guess. Um, and we can, we can, you know, find our way together. Yeah, this is, this is so beautiful. You touched on a point that um, I actually listened to Dr. Catherine Wilkinson speak, and she was talking about the idea of integrity, which I think you just spoke to um, so, so beautifully and how important it is. And I know it's become, it's become a word that's overused, you know, on motivational posters and stuff, but it's, mm -hmm. I think when, when you really look at it, it's actually so profound because um, it, it requires a true alignment within yourself. Like what, mm -hmm. what do I stand in? What do I stand for and, and why? And then showing up as that person, it just builds yeah. so much mutual trust. Um, yeah. That's the word, right? That is the word because integrity really is a matter of trust. It is a matter of, can I want you to trust me and I wanna trust you, but I have to really rely on your integrity to see that. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's what it really comes down to. If, if I want you to really trust me as much as I'm trusting you with my life, because we're talking about the environment and climate and breathing, um, then I got to trust the integrity. And that's been a missing factor, you know, when we really dig into why have there been divisions within the climate movement? Why is there not like one essence of a global understanding of what we need to happen, let alone within our own countries? What is this disconnect? And it really does boil down to, can I trust that you're going to have my best interests of basic human needs versus your company's interest? You know, can I trust that you're going to ensure and look out for how all water, which is something we all need in order to survive, at least people have access to it? Or are you really just telling me something and you're going and doing and preserving for your own self? That is the crux of what we're trying to achieve in terms of coming together to find equitable solutions. And it's not easy. Yeah, moving into climate and realizing that this is my life's purpose and my calling and what I'm here on earth to do has been a profoundly spiritual experience and deepening. And I'm curious to hear from you, how does your faith guide and fortify your work as an environmental advocate? Oh, that we could, I could do a whole sermon. Uh, <laughs> Lord knows. I, I can't do the work without it. And I think you couched it very well to say spirituality. 
Um, Because religion and spirituality are two different things. We can be real religious with no spirituality or as, you know, old folks would say, you can be so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good. (laughs) 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 That's true, right? We can be so, you know, all up here that we are no good to anybody on earth. And I really have to break it down to what is my role? Like, what is God asking me to do? What's the one thing that he, he... God in in whatever identity we place God um, is constantly on Heather to to say this is this is the real thing and I go back to again you know my upbringing and it's to love one another like that was the one basic commandment that we always have to remember is um, we have to love one another it doesn't mean we have to like it because nowhere in the Bible that I have read or the Quran um, or any scripture, says, I have to like it, but I have to love it. Two different things. God loves us, but he doesn't like some of our behaviors. Mm-hmm. Just stop the love. I love my children to the end of this world, but some of the stuff they do, I don't like. Mm-hmm. But part of my expression of love is through teaching and training and showing them over and over and over again, no matter how long it takes, no matter how hard it is, that's the love. And that's what I feel my, um, my journey has been is no matter how many times I screwed up, no matter how many times I think it's wrong, no matter how many times I'm flailing on the floor. Um, the love is get up. We're going to do it again. And we're going to keep practicing this over and over and you're going to get it and you're going to be great. Um, I, my encouragement and motivation from a cultural perspective, and and it took me a long time to to say this out loud, even though I have felt it for years, but a really long time for me to say it. Um, And that is that I come from a people that were removed, physically removed from one ecosystem of plants, animals, people, germs, water, and through a very traumatic way, immediately um, to a different ecosystem. And in the new ecosystem, they not only figured it out, but they taught people who were from an entirely different ecosystem and continent how to grow and thrive. And the fact that the very blood running through my veins is the environmental resiliency of humanity being uprooted and uplifted, placed in place and still learning how to grow Mm -hmm. means everything that is within me tells me I've got the solution and nobody should tell me otherwise. It took a long time for me to realize that and and have both the faith through my faith, but also through my own confidence and and God taught confidence and humility to be able to stand up and say, you know what? I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be in this room. I don't care if there are no other black people in this room. I don't care if there are no other women in this room. I don't care what it is. I am supposed to be right here doing the work that I'm doing because I know that God has already told me everything is within me to do it. So we're just gonna wait till it comes out. And that being my resolve, right? Because that was, it, it to me, it was a slap in the face to my ancestors to not walk in that, to not walk in that knowing. And I think each of us comes from a particular place or space through our family, through our generations that give us that same sense of confidence, that same sense of honoring where we have come from as a way to say, we've got to figure it out, right? We've got to figure out how to solve these issues and these problems. And so, you know, that's where um, I, I stand on the confidence and faith that I have in Christ, the faith that I have in um, what the word of God tells me, uh, the faith that I have in my children as the next generation, and the faith that I have in humanity. Like at the end of the day, I know what the story is going to say. I know the end. Um, And I'm supposed to walk in that. It 
took a long time to get there. It really did. Yeah. Um, and it takes a moment to stay in that space. I'll say this too, um, because I've run into this a lot, particularly in, in climate and science and environmentalism and, and, and the whole movement, running into different people of different faiths or who are agnostic, you have to immediately bring down the temperature and the, um, the stereotypes because, you know, I've got people who are like, I don't believe in God, I believe in science and nature. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm with you. Good. <laughs> you can do whatever you want to do. And I can, we're, and we're still living in the same space. We're still sharing and breathing the same air. How awesome is that? That we can have our own individual beliefs and I can respect yours and you can respect mine. And guess what? I can even sit in this space with you. I love like sitting with Roshi Joan Halifax um, and with the, the, the Buddhist understanding of nature and embracing grief and having to sit in the moment of meditation. That's a skill I need and I can use in my own spirituality and faith. So why would I ignore it? Because it comes out of a different book. No, no, no. I, my commandment was to love. That's part of it. Or um, my favorite understanding and story was when I was in college and went to Kenya <laughs> um, as the only African-American woman in a group of seven women uh, to, to work on women's issues and projects in Kenya. And I was going to an Islamic community, an Islamic part of the country. Um, I didn't, I, I was Christian. I had Islamic friends. And thankfully, my parents always taught me um, to respect all faiths. My godfather is Jewish. I've been to synagogue. I had a blast as a kid celebrating just about every holiday that ever came around from Rosh Hashanah to Ramadan to Christmas. Why? Because I, we had friends who were in all of these spaces and our parents encouraged us to celebrate with them to have an understanding of their faith. So when I went to Kenya, no one accepted me. And I couldn't figure it out. I'd been there a week and I was literally sitting on the beach like, okay, Lord, something's gonna have to happen because I'm here for three months and I, this is not gonna work. <laughs> and I, I, I was led to go to the woman's house who was our translator and to sort of her hut. And um, being familiar with the, the culture and the faith I took off my shoes. Like I took off my hiking boots and I had my socks on. And she came to the door. She said, take off your, take off your socks too. And I took off my socks and she let me into the house and everything opened up. It was as if I had said, I am willing to put aside what I know or what you think I know and embrace what it is you need to share with me and teach me they didn't know how to deal with me because they had no word in their language for a black American. Their word for American was white. So they didn't know what to call me. And it was a, it was an odd situation because they only knew to call me a black white person. That's what a, that's what a black American was. It, literally translated into black white person. Well, I didn't see myself as a black white person that was offensive, especially when I'm in college coming from HBCU. Yeah, oh, it's so interesting. Taking that moment, it helped to bring us to a place where we could see each other and hear each other. And by the time, listen, by the time I left Kenya, I had my own burqa. I was able to go to market. I got all the best prices and I had at least three offers of marriage, one which included camels. So, you know, it, it was just a beautiful, beautiful way that I always remember how important it is to be open to other faiths and cultures. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, I love that it was so sort of literal, like they did not have a name in the language for you, for your identity. And sometimes I wonder if, I mean, it's not always so literal, but even, I don't know, when we're, when we're navigating these cross-cultural, cross-religious spaces, it does seem like, even if, yeah, that there's literally like the, the missing language. And I think that, I mean, I, you know, I navigate between two different languages and I do feel like sometimes having specific words almost like opens up that space in your mind for the mm -hmm. concept. And without the word, sometimes you have to sort of meld it for yourself. Um, well, it, it, and it is, if you're sitting out, 
let's say we're sitting outside in a circle and we're experiencing, oh, here's a great one. I went forest bathing in Puerto Rico. I had no idea what forest bathing is. I didn't even know that that was a concept. It made no sense to me. When it was on the list of activities that we were going to do, I was like, all right, I don't know if we're going to go get in some water in the forest or what's about to happen, but I'm here and I'm here for it. So let's go do it. It was an experience of, um, it was an experience of going in and sort of embracing and just through a guided meditation, um, literally in, in, in encompassing yourself in in the forest, in the space that we were in, to the extent that you may lay down in the leaves, you may be asked to examine something very closely, but it was almost a physical sense of putting, immersing yourself, thus the word bathing, immersing yourself into what is the forest. I felt that that was, oh, you mean I have time to relate with the Holy Spirit and I can sit out in a natural space where all of God's creation is and just me and the Lord have a conversation? Oh, I can do that, you know, which was completely different, a different language than what another person was experiencing. Um, and how, But it was the same experience. Right? It was, there was the, when the wind blew, one person identified this as, okay, this is nature giving me a feeling of what it is. I could, was in moments was like, oh, thank you, Lord, for this sign. Mm -hmm. I feel your wind and your, I'm relating it to scriptures because that's where I come from, you know? Uh, and that's the beauty of this. D am I a, gonna say I'm a forest bathing advocate? Not exactly because I didn't know what it was until I went out there. But when I did, I was like, oh, I know what this is. You know, this is, and this is how I relate to it in this space. Um, and that you're right, you know, identifying the words and the language in a way that we can receive it is so important. Yeah, I got, I got just got goosebumps when you were speaking because um, I'm reading uh, Sherry Mitchell's book right now, Sacred Instructions. And she has this amazing passage in, in one of the open, opening chapters where she describes the spiritual awakening that she had. She's meditating um, in her garden and she sees this little ant um, walk by and then suddenly the ant is illuminated with life force. And then suddenly all the things around her become illuminated with, with light, with life force. And suddenly she realizes mm -hmm. that she's also illuminated and she's breathing in rhythm with the earth and yes. her and her um, her uh, light and vibration merge and become more you know um, in harmony and and it was just this beautiful moment and 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 I think that that's what you're describing and everyone has it in different ways um, but it's it's I, again what you said it's the same experience and I actually just wrote something for. Um, for about my artwork and I said, you know, the rekindling our spiritual connection to the earth is what will save us from extinction. Mm -hmm. And I really think that that's true. I think that this, it's a, it's a humbling, it's at once very humbling because you're one, you're part of this bigger, vast, um, you know, living, breathing earth or, or part of God's creation, whichever mm -hmm. language you use it, you, whatever language you use to describe it. Um, but you realize that you're part of a whole. And I think that that is yeah. really important for the work ahead is coming to it from that space. And I think that the integrity almost, it like is born out from that space. At least it, it was for me. Um, yeah, it's, um, um, it, if I can just add, it's also, it, that it, 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 for me, it has always been very humbling in those spaces because, you know, that experience like so many others, I will push against it, right, initially, of our lives and our activities like I don't have time to go out here and do this you know I, I, I don't have time to just sort of sit outside and you know we, we're so movement focused that we don't stop to take these times out and and I have found that when I do a couple of things happen one that experience like what you just described for me is constantly a reminder you know of God saying I am always always talking always talking to you. You have to quiet yourself to listen to me. Mm -hmm. 
And as Reverend Michael Malcolm said in a great, great conversation we had about faith, he says, you know, the Bible says that all of nature is a witness to God's action. Every time we encounter any form of nature, it serves as a witness. In fact, every time God appeared in the Bible, nature was there as a witness for every story, whether or not it was the burning bush or um, it was Mary who was outside when the angel came and, and the place in the garden when she was or the garden of Gethsemane. Every time, every time there is any type of interaction, nature is the witness. That is the connection. And so the other humbling piece of it for me is God says, there's nothing new under the sun. I gave you examples. And the example that hits me in the gut every time is the indigenous community in, in Northern America gave us the examples of this. And what, what have we done with it? Have we honored that? Uh, I, I love some of the indigenous leaders in the environmental justice movement who continue to show us in real life um, example of their way of connecting with nature, very, very common sense, mm -hmm. you know, um, but a response of being a protector, a defender, but a part of the ecosystem. So it's not, you know, I go back to saying, okay, this wasn't new. Forest bathing is not new. We have indigenous communities who have been trying to tell us this. And we have to respect the fact that even if it's to the extent of saying, you know what, I apologize, my bad. Um, let me listen. Let me not see this as something, you know, that I have this new awakening for when even before anybody hit set foot on these northern, um, this northern United, what we now know as the United States of America, y'all were doing this for generations. Let me not disrespect the sacred spaces and how indigenous people have identified this space and or me come in here and try to reclassify or identify it is a deeply humbling moment for me um, spiritually, but also when I think about the social justice actions and policies. Yes, I've, that's been so transformative for me. This, this year is reconnecting to indigenous wisdom. And I, and I use the word reconnecting very purposefully because it feels so familiar. Um, I, I really felt like when I'm, when I'm reading these words and hearing these practices, it feels like I'm returning home. Um, mm -hmm. Something that, that I've always know, almost like a, maybe a childhood home that you don't really remember, but when you come back, you're just immediately, your body relaxes into it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what, rediscovering, reconnecting indigenous wisdom feels like for me. And something else that you said that, that really resonated with me was this slowing down. And I, and, I, and I use the word embodied a lot these days to talk about, um, you know, how I want to be in the world. And I think that that is that sort of slowing down and, and connecting, you know, to God, to the earth, to these spaces. Because I think we tend as humans, or at least I do, I'm up here so much in my head. And, mm. That moment, I, I actually meant to do it today. Speaking of, I didn't take my own advice before our conversation. I really wanted some time to meditate, actually, just to drop into my body. Um, but of course, you know, it, it, it was a little kid. It didn't happen. But um, <laughs> I, do know that I, I do show up as a, as as more fully. It's not even a better version of myself because that's not that you know that's not exactly. It's 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 more like I'm more fully myself, more present, mm. more more in my body when I do that. Mm -hmm. I think that you, you, Said that beautifully. Um, so um, I'm going to go back actually to a question, and um, and uh, this it's the last one. But I'm going to ask you about your book, which I'm really excited about. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this is sort of um, this is a big one, and I think that we've also touched upon it a lot in our conversation. But if there's anything that you would like to maybe add or, or um, elaborate on, it's so you articulate the intersections of different forms of injustice so eloquently. And I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on this for people that aren't familiar with the concept of how and which, what are the ways in which climate justice and racial justice are intertwined? Mm -hmm. So intersectionality is, a, is actually a term, it's not new. And, and forgive me, I cannot remember 
the woman's name who actually developed this, the, the name of intersectionality, but act, the, the first time I really thought of it this way, it was in reference to um, the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution and historically the, the, the women who were, um, there's a woman of color who's an attorney and I can't, I just cannot remember her name, who was um, very instrumental in tying together equal justice, women's rights, um, and the right to marriage, you know, the right to marry if you want to, the right to interracial marriage. But she did a profound, profound way of layering on top of each other how all of these issues are so intertwined that you cannot have equal justice. You cannot call yourself or we cannot call ourselves um, purveyors of equality if we have not addressed every layer of this situation. And that's how I think of the intersectionality between climate justice, racial equity, and justice. We cannot realize the full breadth and scope of what equality is if we're not willing to address the past and existing inequities in all of our systems, because all of the systems have aided into the continuation of the inequity. So climate <laughs> I, 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 so Dr. Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, another wonderful, amazing climate advocate, he um, said this, when we think about the transport of Africans, enslaved Africans to the United States, packed into a boat, layered on top of each other in a very close confine, stagnant, unbreathable air, living in waste, in excrement for months on years, on time. Um, them being viewed as a product that could be moved in this way and survived. How is that different? Or how did that even aid into the way that we see how racist housing policies in the 50s in the United States of piling people into um, concrete stacked on top of each other, housing projects um, with little ventilation um, next to landfills, um, permitting and zoning industrial waste next to people of color and indigenous people, it is directly tied to how we have seen and viewed people in racist ways, be they African-American, Asian Pacific Islander, because um, let's not forget the, the travesties that took place and how we categorize people, Latino Americans, um, whose country and part of their land we actually you know, are sitting in and on now. Um, if we don't, at least address the fact that yes, our policies did this and said that because they did not see people as being equal. We did not have an equal right. Black Americans came back from World War II where they had fought alongside white Americans in some of the spaces where you're sitting right now, Claire. And they came back to the United States, they received a benefit, but now a white family or a white soldier could, veteran could go and purchase a house in one particular area where he had sidewalks, trees, good school systems. And the same amount of money given to a black American or my grandfather who fought in World War II only allowed him to live in certain places because of housing covenants and restrictions and policies. And so these very ideas of how we have gotten to this place must be reckoned with if we're to figure out all right, well, how do we fix all this? Why do we need this infrastructure money to come and dismantle racist highways that have broken up black and brown neighborhoods? How do we rebuild these spaces um, in a way that is equitable and wealth building such that it does not take us another hundred years to get to this space? And then on top of that, how do we ensure we're making and having this conversation around equity for everybody? Because, you know, this is not over. We're still talking about our LGBTQ, um, <clears throat> LGBTQ uh, friends and, and brothers and sisters who are dealing with some of the same travesties 
Right now in the United States, there's state after state that are legislating against children. I mean, let's think about that. They're legislating against children. They're legislating voting suppressions. So this fight is not over because the very people who are more likely to vote on climate policy based upon the data and, and voting records are black and brown people. They're people who have um, benefited from equal rights. So if we need the people who are marginalized to be the ones to vote for climate policies, we sure as heck better be working on these voter suppression issues or we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Oh, so yeah. all these overlapping layers are so important to address if we're really to recognize real climate solutions. Yes, 100%. I actually, um, yeah, I, I talk all the time about if you care about climate, you, you better be paying attention to voter, voter rights. You're never going to get, um, you know, we're never going to get the climate legislation that we need unless everyone can vote. Uh, and sometimes, actually, I had a sort of a, a, a great moment. We, we have a book circle and we were talking like, oh, what do we need to change, you know, these, these oil executives' minds or the politicians' minds? And, and, and someone said so brilliantly and so rightly, they're like, don't focus about on them. Focus on getting everyone voting rights so they become obsolete. <laughs> and I was like, that part. of course. Um, yeah, it, yeah, there's so many, that, that's how they, they know. They know how powerful it is, which is why they're trying to get us just, yeah, not vote. But um. Yeah, there was a, a, a wonderful talk by uh, David uh, Lammy, I believe, um, on the TED countdown, and he said something that really uh, struck a chord with me. He said that climate change is colonialism's natural uh, like outcome. Like it's mm. just the, it's the it's the inevitable endpoint to mm -hmm. a, a worldview and economy that's based purely on extraction and exploitation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yes. I loved everything. And it is a, it's a difference in Christian view that um, people see differently. There is, you know, uh, creation care and there's dominionism and they coexist in the same space. So understanding that is also, I think, key to understanding sort of how we have gotten to this place. Yeah. And Heather, you've been so generous with your time and your answers have been so expansive and wonderful. I have enjoyed this so much. Um, and my last question for you is I want to know all about your new book project and ah. you can get a copy. I'm so excited. <laughs> so still working on this book project, but I, I am really excited about it. So I do have a book project I'm working on called The Darker Shades of Green, and it is exploring um, the intersections between climate and social justice through the lens of the African-American experience and our stories. So um, the book sort of goes and takes us on a journey of um, environmental justice, police brutality, extreme weather and climate, education disparities, faith in climate, housing issues, immigration, all through the lens of um, the Black experience, the lived Black experience. So there are lots of stories from me, my experiences, but also um, experiences of, of people that are close to me that speak to these issues, but through uh, a, a, a different shade of green. <laughs> I cannot wait to read it. I'm so excited. Um, you know, I, I probably because I did not meditate like I was supposed to before we started our call, I forgot to mention that um, that we had an open Q&A. <laughs> <Q &A. laughs> oh, Lord, did I miss it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, anyone, um, uh, there's, there's, there is a question. Um, okay. We have a, if, if you have time, do you have another 10 or 15? Yeah, minutes? I do. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, Louisa asks, we have a safe and we have, a, um, we have a safe and just 2030. I wonder how Heather sees our path there. Oh, so um, yes, we are. I think there are a lot of folks who say, okay, we have to get to this. We can't say 2050, right? That's, it's like, I want climate action. I want climate action in 20 years. Nope, we need it right now. And 2030 is not that far away. So I think it's going to take some really bold initiatives. It's going to take a lot of investment. It's going to take global um, cooperation. Um, cutting our emissions, you know, looking at what are the biggest sectors and, and really taking some bold moves to not only 
um, look at our standards, but create enforcement. I know a lot of folks don't like hearing that, especially on the corporate side. Um, but I do think that even the conversation now is spurring some of the, the some of the worst actors to rethink, you know, their their positions. So things like the corporate tax increase that the Biden administration is talking about is actually starting to make some people think about how they do things differently, especially if they're going to get incentives for um, or, or for reducing their uh, their emission footprint. Moving to clean and renewable energy very quickly is going to be another important piece, but doing it in a way that's equitable um, is critical. So that will be the uh, implementation of EV infrastructure. Um, I think all across this country, you know, at least in the United States, is different in Europe. Um, I think in Europe, I saw way more cars that were uh, electric or small or you know reasonable. I live in the South. We all were, we everybody's got a truck, so <laughs> you know it's a it's a different world. But we're getting there, you know, to see the announcements from GM um, and to see how people are really. Uh, accepting a lot of different kinds of uses of energy is important. And then I'd say finally, um, how we talk about this has to change before 2030. Um, and, and let me try to, I guess, it break it down like this. So much of the environmental conversation is at people, is telling to do this. You need to reduce your plastics. You need to not use as many straws. You need to make sure that you're planting a garden in your backyard. No offense to any of these things, but for people who have been marginalized, their response back is, why do I as the victim have to be the one who solves the problem? How am I supposed to plant that garden if I don't own the property that I live on because of whatever policy and the landlord does not allow it. That's a very real issue. So, you know, it's like we come up with all these great ideas, but how, if we don't address justice, are we going to deal with it? Because it's not implementable. So talking about this differently has to be a part of the conversation. We can't victimize the people who have been suffering from climate and environmental disparities. We have to talk about economy. We gotta talk about creating jobs. We gotta talk about how we are you know, shifting the landscape of our communities and how people have a stake in that and they have a say and showing folks their own ownership, empowering them. So we've got to change our language as an accomplice to all of the other big, big pieces. I love that. I love the um, um, AOC's uh, green. I think she did a video where she was uh, 10 years in the future. And so oh. <laughs> you know, I loved it. It was such a great exercise. And exactly this talking about the yes, instead of it's sort of sort of chastising people and telling them that they need to be better, which is never works. Doesn't work. <laughs> um, so SUNY um, asks, uh, Heather, what tip would you give someone who is new in this movement? And how can I give, bring these conversations into my work environment? Ah, find what your space is, you know, and, and that, that's going to sound really weird. Climate can be so big and overwhelming that people are like, oh, nope, I don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, that's a big problem. And I just can't go in here and say I'm tackling climate change. My first question would be, what is the work? You know, what, um, what, is, what is the environment and space and where are you comfortable? Uh, if you are a theater person, then you may not be comfortable talking about, we need to make sure that the corporations are paying the right tax on carbon. Like that's not your space. But your space may be finding artistic ways to change the language of people about how they interact with climate. I, I really encourage people who are new in the, the, the movement. Um, number one, you're not new in the movement, even though you think you are. You've been connected in some shape, form, or fashion. And climate action is both action or inaction. So start with self. <laughs> um, and I write down the ways that you think you impact the, the environment, but also how you think the environment impacts you. And I just do three of each. You know, you, you can say, I, I pick up all the plastic wear every time I go out to eat, or I don't use plastic bags. You know, you, I identify maybe three ways, but also think about that other side. How are you impacted by the climate? Do you live by a railway? Do you breathe different air? 
Do you have to drink filtered bottled water or do you live by a nice spring? Um, think through these things because it will help you to define what your own interaction is and your level of comfortability to then talk about that in larger groups and perspectives. I love that, um, Heather. That's such a great answer. I know for myself, I became really active the day that I realized that I might not ever be able to go snorkeling with my child, which is mm. something I've been looking forward to since I was little. I remember being like a little kid being like, wow, one day I'm going to be a mom and do this. And um, that really broke my heart and, and it broke my heart open. And I think that mm -hmm. climate's such a big issue that everyone has that one thing that once they realize that it's in danger that they might not have it uh, or might not be able to give it to their kids that it really, and it breaks their, you know, breaks their heart enough that they can become really engaged. And yeah. No. So I'm gonna push you further, Celeste, because mm. while there's that moment of breaking open and thinking of what you may not have, mm -hmm. Think of it also as what may not be um, the reverse benefit there, you know, for you. Um, what is it that, yeah, I may not be able to show my kids and I'm heartbroken about that, but also will my kid be able to go to school without an oxygen mask? Yeah. Um, because of whatever is happening, like how is the environment actually impacting us and be in a space where that happens regularly. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was, you know, had the reckoning about environmental impacts everywhere, but even as an EPA administrator, and I was again working in the environment for the federal government when I got pregnant with my, with my son Devin was when Zika happened, whole new opening for me because it was like, oh my God, vector borne diseases might impact my unborn child all over again. It was the, the fresh experience all over again. And I think the more we allow ourselves to constantly be in this space, mm -hmm. uh, all right, we gotta, there's another place. Let's figure out what is the solution here. It keeps us in a forward, it keeps us moving forward, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know. Yeah, there's so much power. There was actually, there was a great, <laughs> a great uh, uh, chapter in All We Can Save, really coming from like a mom's perspective and you're you know working with Moms Clean Air Force, it's just like, don't mess with the moms. <laughs> <laughs> don't mess with our babies. Uh. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's so true. Everything you're saying is just, I, I'm getting a lot of uh, private messages from people going like, I love this, this is so amazing. So um, yeah. <laughs> And um, so um, my father actually, Carlos, asks, uh, he says, I like the idea of colonialism and climate change seen as a cause and effect. Is this a new starting point to talk about the climate crisis or talk about climate change? Um, I think it's an old starting point. Um, so there's a uh, indigenous leader, her name is Tara Huska, and I love her. She's a um, tribal attorney and a water keeper in Minnesota. Uh, and she has a whole thing where she talks about decolonizing climate. Like, I, I, I quoted her on something because she said, we are not going to solve the environmental crisis through solar panels. Like, <laughs> just yeah. completely, let's dismantle <laughs> this entire conversation, um, which is, it's, it's, it's not new. We're just hearing it. We're just open now to hearing, I think, so many other perspectives than a very um, Eurocentric perspective. There is no longer this ownership of climate and environmentalism from one demographic. Uh, and, and so now we're hearing some things that have been said over and over and over again, and finally realizing that if we're going to get to this space where the International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, says we need to be in 10 years, then we cannot do it alone. So I said at a hearing, um, it's like, I know everybody says we're all in the same boat. We are not, we're not all in the same boat. Um, we're in the same storm, but some people are on an aircraft carrier. Some people are in a rowboat, some people are on a yacht and some people are on a floaty. Um, <laughs> we are in the same storm, but how we are experiencing this storm is very different. And the action of one drastically impacts 
the other. So when that aircraft carrier makes a just two degree turn, it may take a long time for it to make that two degree turn, but that two degree turn can protect that rowboat and that floaty from coming waves. Um, you know, there, there are things that we can do and we're finally at the place realizing, I think, the, the interactions that we have with one another and it's causing us to hear differently. Yeah. Yes, I, I've been really questioning everything. I think that the, the decolonize, I'm, that's something I'm just trying to um, live. And it's such, it's inner work. I think that's, I think that there's this sort of uh, wish, like, give me, you know, three things to do today it's to save the planet. And it's like, it's, yeah, do the inner work to decolonize your mind, <laughs> you know, which is really, it's a lifelong process. It's, it's generations long. <clears throat> but I really do think that, that, that looking at the trauma and, and, and looking at the damage done and looking at how internalized it's become. And then, and I think that that's the starting point. And, and that's what I love so much about um, leaders like you that it feels like a flourishing. It feels like growth. It feels, um, it feels so good. It feels, it feels like nature, like resilient mm. and um, alive and with so much possibility. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm actually in the middle of a book called The Mushroom at the End of the World uh, the, on the possibility of life and capitalist ruins. Mm. It's really beautiful because it, it's talking about how we really need to shift from this sort of forward facing capitalist mentality of like, there's the end point, we go there, time is linear. Um, and instead, actually look at the world how it is, right? Which is um, lots of different realities, all intertangled, um, uh, much messier, um, but much more beautiful. And I think mm -hmm. that the possibility of regrowth really lies in that space that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And openness to embrace it, whatever it may look like. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Heather, this was just wonderful. Um, I, I, I love you even more. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I love this conversation. It's definitely been a bright spot in my day. Oh, thank you so much. It I hope incredible. you to have these kinds of conversations because it just... You know, it does something, I think, for all of us to know that we're not the only one, you know, you're not the only one that um, is out here trying to figure it out. Nobody has it all together, right? But we're all doing the best we can for the people that we love and for the planet that we love. And, and I think that collectively continuing to do that puts us in a better space of achieving real solutions and goals and allowing me to retire somewhere on a beach with a cool breeze and I want that I want to see one day I want to be scrolling social media and I want to see you just that real selfie with my toes I just pedicure and the waves that's it. That's me. That's me. <laughs> You're just carrying your flag. Yeah. Uh, I love that. <laughs> I want that. Thank you for all the love that you bring into this space. I feel oh, great. I feel um, lighter. I feel, yeah, your, your joyfulness is uh, infectious. I, I appreciate you so much and everything you do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Who came? I'm waving at the. <laughs> yes, and thanks to everyone who came. Yeah, Heather, all all to be questions. cannot wait to read your book when it comes Yay. out. And um, <laughs> yes, have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.